uh, welcome to all of you. I uh, appreciate you stopping by for this coffee chat. Um, my guest today is Matt Miller from Embroker. Uh, a little bit about Matt. He is the founder and CEO of Embroker. Uh, he writes frequently on insurance technology and innovation and is recognized as one of the key thought leaders in the space. Uh, he previously worked in private equity for Hellman and Friedman and Bain Capital and served on the boards of Hub International, Applied Systems, and Renaissance Learning. Uh, Matt graduated from Duke University and earned an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he was an R.J. Miller Scholar. Uh, welcome, Matt. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me. Uh, my pleasure, um, because what you're doing is, is intensely interesting there at Embroker. Um, and why don't you just, uh, for the folks who are here, give a, a quick overview of uh, what Embroker does. Certainly, yeah. So Embroker is the, the first tech-driven commercial insurance brokerage. So you know, our core business is uh, selling insurance to businesses and, and providing risk management services. I think what makes us different from people that have tried to do it before are that we're building technology from the ground up that's meant to make the process smoother and more easy and more intuitive. Mm -hmm. So, you're, you're, uh, you, this is not self-described, this is my terminology, but, but you seem to be looking to disrupt the traditional uh, broker-policyholder relationship in a, in a certain fashion. I'm wondering if, that, if you would characterize that as accurate, and, and, and what is the opportunity that you see? What, what, is, what is the, you know, what sort of pain of the policyholder or the consumer uh, are you addressing with this with this approach? Yeah, well, I think it, you know I, I don't use the word disrupt. I find it a little bit overused in in the valley. I think it, it's lost its meaning a little bit uh, in terms of what that concept actually expresses. Um, but I believe that there is an incredible opportunity for improvement in terms of the way that that insurance works up and down the value chain. Uh, and I think what's created the opportunity for improvement uh, is the fact that um, insurance has not really kept up with a lot of the advancements in other parts of our society due to technology. And so, you know, the concept of insurance and the ability to protect oneself or one's business against an uncertain loss is a foundational part of our economy. It's incredibly important and uh, will continue to be, you know, for as long as we have a modern financial system. Um, but when you actually look at how insurance works, at how efficient it is, and importantly, at how wasteful it is in terms of the dollar premium you spend as, as a business and where that money actually goes, it just it doesn't work that well. Um, and so we think that uh, it's time that somebody takes a different approach in terms of really integrating technology uh, and software into the actual core workflows of insurance and trying to improve it from that angle. Mm -hmm. And so, so with your process, is, is a broker or an insurance professional uh, ever involved or is it all done with, with AI and and uh, uh, you know, user interface and technology. No, no. I think, I mean, to the contrary, we, we employ a large number of insurance professionals that are brokers that, that help our customers with any number of uh, things that they need. I think there are certain things that software will be better and more efficient than people at, and certain things that people will be more efficient and better than software. One of them, I think, is just answering questions and helping people when they're confused and have a decision to make. I think we're a long way away from you know software taking over that. I think. What, what's interesting, though, is that, that the core job of an insurance broker uh, is taking information from a customer, sending it to a carrier, uh, taking information back from any number of carriers, putting together recommendations for customers based on that. And you know, there really just isn't much technology involved in the actual transfer of, of information digitally, which is a, you know, a huge pain point in terms of both customers that need to wait a long time uh, for getting information back and, and you know, brokers that just use a lot of their time on pretty inefficient workflows. So, so that's the the opportunity you see is that that, that transfer of information um, from uh, person to person to person to person back is 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 where the the inefficiencies are when it should go directly from uh, a business owner such as myself to uh, uh, through through a system I put in the I input the information and it then sends it out and and brings it back to me directly and I don't I don't actually need that middle. Uh, uh, brain in there. 
Well, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I'd say, uh, to the contrary, you know, we believe that you do need an intermediary. I mean, what, what we are is an intermediary, and it's a market where I think you'll always need intermediaries because uh, when you think about risk pricing, it's actually quite heterogeneous in the sense that you, you know, your, your business, Chromium, uh, if you have insurance that, that's professional liability, what is the chance that you get sued by somebody because you said something that you shouldn't have? Uh, you know, I think intelligent people can disagree about, you know, what that risk is. It's a hard risk to price. And so what you need is a market maker, essentially, that can actually go and find somebody else to provide liquidity on that trade to say, okay, you know, Johnny, I think that your insurance policy is going to cost 10000 I think it's going to cost 5000 You know, you can't go out and figure that out yourself, at least not right now. And so you do need an intermediary to go, you know, make that market and provide liquidity for you. Uh, the issue is that just the current way that it works is super inefficient. And so when you look at where the money goes, so for your $10,000 or $5,000 that you're spending, uh, a lot of it just goes to people that aren't really adding much value in different parts of the ecosystem and carriers with a bloated cost structure. And it just could work much better. Mm -hmm. So the, the, um, uh, the, the, let's talk a little bit about, about Embroker as, as, as a company, as a brand. And uh, typically when one thinks of brokers, it's usually Smith & Associates, right? Or or uh, you know the, the 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 Williams agency or something to that. It's always sort of related to a person. How how sort of how being a, a company that clearly says we are not just an individual, but uh, we are a company. We're a platform. You know, you say M broker. I, I assume that's Empower and M broker, um, not M dash M broker. Although no, yeah, you, have, you have an M dash in your logo. Uh, okay. The, the, that how, how does that brand um, how, how do you sort of advance that brand in the marketplace what you know I, I understand that you're that you're doing some brand work right now so sort of mm -hmm. tell us that the journey you, you took to get to the current and broker brand and what you're thinking of, of doing with it uh, in the in the near future yeah I think yeah as you mentioned the concept you know the name came from you know as I mentioned I, I don't believe that brokers are going away or, or that brokers don't provide a lot of value I think to the contrary you know brokers provide you know a great deal of value um, in a number of ways and so you know but I think that w what they haven't traditionally done is empower the customer they, they've created a role for themselves where they uh, can try to make themselves you know really critical to the customer but they're not really empowering them they're like oh, don't worry I have it covered I think we see a vision for insurance working quite differently where the role of the broker uh, is to empower businesses and provide them with risk management tools. Um, you know, we think about risk management as a very core business function, just like accounting or, or finance or marketing. And so, you know, but we want to empower them to take ownership of it uh, and to provide them with tools and resources uh, and expertise and guidance um, where they need it. And so, you know, for our brand, we do think about it as, you know, creating a... Um, Creating something that, that is quite different, that represents a path forward, that represents uh, a modern solution to business insurance. And I think that that first and foremost is, is where we focus, which is that uh, because we've spent uh, a lot of time and money and energy of, of building our own technology, um, but it, it's, it's not, you know, people ask me a lot about, you know, sort of like, what is the platform, like, when is it out, and what does it do? And, you know, there's answers to all those questions in terms of what we've built, but I think it's, it's less about the current products that we have and what we're coming to market with, and it's more about our organization, which is that we are dedicated to innovation, we are dedicated to research and development, and what we have now and what we have a year from now and what we have five years from now will be completely different um, because we're going to invest you know, a tremendous amount of time and energy into building something that works better. And we want our brand to reflect that. Uh, we want it to reflect um, someone that is not only an expert in the industry, but that is committed to innovation as part of our DNA. Like it's not something that we're releasing and then it's done and now you can go buy it. It's, you know, we, we think about ourselves as a technology organization that will be building uh, innovative technology for years and perhaps decades to come. Mm -hmm. So uh, questions are coming in from the, the audience and, and one of them is, you know, and I think you've partially answered this, if, if I'm a business owner and I say, you know, what, what is different? How do you, what, what's sort of the elevator pitch that you would use to say, how is a broker different from uh, from a, a regular, you know, regular uh, guy at Smith and Associates. Yeah, I mean, well, it depends how short the elevator ride is. <laughs> in a very short elevator ride, I, I would say, you know, better, cheaper, and faster. Uh, and you know, in a longer elevator ride, I, I would say that, you know, we offer tools and resources that no one else has. Uh, you know, we think our team, uh, as risk managers, actually can go toe to toe with anyone else in the business. 
um, but we supplement them with resources that give you information uh, that utilize your data to find coverages that are better fit. And we tend to save people money by placing policies better uh, and consolidating policies, and uh, we tend to improve their coverages. Okay, that's good. And how do you how do you address the question of of the issue of licensing? Uh, I, you know, as uh, every state has has a different licensing requirement, and and uh, and essentially says that that every agent has to be um, has to be licensed. So, as a as a as a as an entity, as opposed to again as as a Smithco, how does how does an algorithm get licensed? You know, how does a platform get licensed? So, I mean, our our business is licensed uh, in all fifty states and the District of Columbia. Um, I'm personally licensed in all fifty states. The District of Columbia. All of our agents that work with customers are licensed, and so you know, the platform uh -huh. again is not transacting insurance. We have agents that transact insurance, and they're licensed agents. I think you, you know we believe that uh, the regulatory framework that exists is important, and you know protects people and consumers, and you know it gives us a rule book that, that we need to follow. And I think we're we're very strict about following it. Um, we, we have a VP of compliance who you know, has a background in the insurance industry and makes sure that we're on top of these things because um, you know, there, are, there are rules that one needs to follow in this industry. Yeah, and you, you mentioned sort of then the, the people. Tell me a little bit about the, the culture of within, within Embroker. Um, how would you describe your, your core values and, and how do you operate as a culture um, you know, with those core values in mind? What, uh, what sort of the the, the how you do things uh, approach there at Embroker. Yeah, that's a good question, and it's an important question. I mean, I think about uh, culture as probably what's the most distinctive quality of, of any company uh, and of any organization that works and is functional. Uh, I think you can tell a lot by its culture just immediately as to whether whether or not it's, it's someone that or something that you want to be a part of, that you want to work with. Um, and in our case, you know, we think about our culture as a reflection of our values, you know, we have specific values uh, that are based on empathy, tenacity, pride, and, and innovation. Um, and it, but it all starts really for us with empathy. We think about ourselves as a customer-driven organization, a customer-centric organization, uh, and so we try to, you know, basically build that through every aspect of how we deal with each other, of how we deal with our clients, of how much emphasis we, we place on on. Uh, making sure that we go the extra mile for clients. I mean, at the end of the day, we're a service organization, and so I think our values reflect that. But yeah. uh, at, the, at the same time, we're melding, you know, to what have historically been very different cultures, which is the culture of a Silicon Valley, you know, technology startup, with the culture of an established insurance brokerage. And uh, right. you know, I'd say that that's it's certainly both a challenge and an opportunity because I think that without one or the other, it, it wouldn't work. I mean, we can't, as I mentioned, not something that just is software play where we're building software. We have you know, a really deep team of um, experts in insurance with 30 plus years of experience in the industry each and you know, I think that that's really what, you know, I think people that want to be a part of this organization are those that understand that it's really the melding of those two cultures into something that's new and different and that feeds off each other that, that provides us value. And so I think it's been a lot of fun for all of us to uh, you know, tread that path and we're I think still uh, in the early days of, of figuring out how far we can go with it. Yeah, you know, you mentioned your your core values there, um, some of which I, I caught, you know, tenacity, um, uh, and, and do you do you think if you asked anybody in Embroker that that uh, that pretty much to the employee they could name those core values, list them off just as you did just now? Yeah, is, is there so. clarity and alignment behind those core values? Yeah, there is. I mean, I, I speak about them a lot. I mean, sometimes it's hard when you're when you're growing so rapidly. We have new employees that join every week, and so I think that that's that is something that we place uh, yeah, a great deal of emphasis on. Um, one of them is, is written. You can't see right now, but this one is painted on our wall, so that probably helps. That does help. I've been writing it on the wall, and uh, and, and and is it is it is a discussion? Is it a, a point of discussion? Say at a meeting, uh, when when there are decisions to be made, do you say, okay, if we make it the decision this way is that more in line or less in line with our core values? I, I ask that because you know the, recently the this uh, with this scandal with Wells Fargo, you know where right now you've got Jim Stump blaming some you know, rogue employees, 3,500 rogue employees, yeah. and and saying it has nothing to do with the culture. And I'm yeah. thinking to myself, and it seems to have everything to do with the culture. And I wonder if those employees uh, were making those decisions based on a 
a um, an acquired core value that was not necessarily a particularly good one. And so, do you make do you make conscious decisions? Do you actually say, you know, when you're making these decisions, well, this doesn't really fit with our core values, or it does? Yeah, it's funny. I think it's, it's a good question. I think that you know, 99 percent of the time we don't. You know, I think it's like if you actually have to ask every single decision you have, if you have to go through and say, all right, you do this or do that, well, there's a line. Like you have to have that conversation each time. It's not only in systems. I think it just shows that, like a lack of confidence and clarity in what your values are. Like it should be obvious. It should go without saying. I think there's maybe one percent of the time where you, you know you have two things in conflict and, and you have to decide which one of these you know equally competing priorities do we do we want to um, buy into or believe in and maybe you know then you can explicitly consult them. But I think that values are something that should be ingrained in kind of how you do things. They shouldn't be you know they should guide your decisions, but through not through an explicit conversation about them, but just because the, it leads you to the right decisions. Right. It's interesting. So you also mentioned a little bit about your DNA being technology. When, when you think of the, the DNA of the brand, if you had to come up with what we call your, your brand essence, you know, a short phrase, two or three words, or, or maybe just a word. Uh, for example, our, our brand essence at Chromium is catalyst. You know, we want to make sure that, that uh, we catalyze the success of our customers because we don't, we don't save the world. We don't protect people from uh, risk. You guys do, but we want to would make you want to make you successful. So we, our one word is catalyst. You know, do you have a, a brand essence like that, a word or a short phrase? Yeah, I mean, I think we have we have several of them. I mean, one of the key concepts for us is uh, game changing. I mean, we think about that as part of the brand. That's extraordinarily important. And you know, I think that that is again, you know, this concept of game changing is less that we've done anything yet, you know, or that, that we've already changed it. It's more that, that we're disrupting everything. And, you know, I think people take that in a certain way to be like, oh, you know, that you're emphasizing something where it's really not that different or you're not doing anything different. And, and all of that may be true, but I think if that's a part of the brand and if that's a part of the aspiration that you want to build as an organization, then eventually, you know, it will be true. Like it may take years. It may take, you know, 10 years. It may take decades. But I think if that is at the core of what you believe in and what you want to achieve, which it is for us, um, then it becomes something that is true and, and um, you know really reflects the core of the brand. Right. And as a as a as a game changing brand, um, what when you look into the into the future, what's what's the better world that that Embroker is is providing to its customers? Right. There's a certain state of affairs right now um, where there's a there's a particular way that that insurance is approached and and the way the insurance is. You know, decisions are made and insurance insurance is dispensed. Um, what what's the better state of affairs that that uh, M Broker is is looking to bring about as a brand? Yeah, I think that you know, there's it, the vision is is one that I think extends beyond um, just kind of fixing pain points, and I think that's important. Which is that I think we can all envision how insurance work better. I mean, everyone that's bought insurance, whether personally or, or for your business. You know, there are, there are some rather obvious pain points, you know, that it, it takes a long time and it's really opaque and it's not transparent, it's hard to understand. Um, and so, I mean, those, those are things that, um, you know, we feel like we can address, you know, making it more seamless and efficient and modern. Uh, and the efficient part, I think, is important because one of the things that people outside the industry don't often understand is just how much waste there is in insurance. You know, if you look at, uh, 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 you know, a dollar of commercial premium, maybe only 50 cents of that is actually paid out in claims, maybe less. It depends on the line of business. Um, so we think about that as all things that are within the scope of what we're focusing on. But I think more broadly, you know, our vision is not just to fix problems with insurance, but to think about how to use insurance to fix problems that the industry hasn't addressed yet. Like we fundamentally believe in insurance deeply, that, that it's an important, important um, industry and that it's one that we want to promote and support, you know, and I think one of the ways that we can do that is to look at whether it's new businesses or new problems that, you know, there is no insurance for. I mean, there is an interesting article about, you know, insurance for rockets like space travel, uh, things that, that, you know, are actually the lack of being able to insure those assets makes it harder to enter those industries. Um, and so I'm not saying yeah. we're moving into that right now, I'm just, but I think that that's, it's, it's an aspiration for not just looking at something and saying, hey, this is broken, we need to fix it, but say, hey, you know, the concept of insurance is not broken. Let's look at how we can leverage it and expand it to, you know, new problems and new industries. Yeah, I've heard uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk when I've been uh, talking to ins our insurance clients that uh, uh, drones are posing a particularly interesting quandary. You know, what, 
what's the liability there? What kind of risks need to be managed? Uh, so things of this of this nature. A question came up while you were talking there, uh, uh, and and the question is is can you be a little bit more specific? So these efficiencies you're talking about, what what tasks are are performed by humans, uh, you know, insurance professionals within the organization, and which tasks are, are relegated to your AI or your algorithms? I think, I mean, so that would be a, a fairly long answer to the question, and it's one that changes monthly, so it's, it's a little hard to pinpoint. And, I, you know, I, I, would, but I would say, you know, I can talk about what we're doing now and kind of what the vision is and what the goal is, which is that a lot of tasks currently, you know, in insurance right now are fundamentally related to data entry of different sorts. So you're entering data into a system, you're collecting data and entering it into other systems, um, and you're preparing a marketing presentation for a customer by pulling data from different carriers and you know attaching it to the same and you know, putting it into it. And I think that you know to be clear, like we're we're still doing some of those things. Like we have not yet fully automated all those processes with people, but I think the goal is that we're now moving to a world where more and more we'll be able to use uh, technology and systems to do information collection and information transfer, uh, and that people will talk to customers. I mean, the goal is what we really want people to do is be on the phone with customers, supporting them, answering questions, um, providing value and expertise. And you know, we think it's a better division of labor because it's a better job, frankly, than doing really manual rote processes. Uh, and, I, and I think it's what people enjoy more. Um, and so that yeah. I think I, I mentioned to you how. I remember uh, my when I when I used to ride a motorcycle, um, which ended right about the time the kids arrived. Um, the 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 guy would have this giant sheet of of uh, carbon paper, and he would he would write up all these things and and fold it in these certain ways and tear off pieces and give it to me. And this and I thought to myself, you have to do this every day, all day long, <laughs> and it just seemed it did seem a little bit uh, inefficient. I'm sure that you know. Things have progressed yeah. since then, but it sounds like maybe you're, not. <laughs> you're. Yeah, maybe not. Um, a, a question came in from uh, Caitlin, and she says, as she's a small business owner, and the question, in which you partially answered, I think, is, is that a lot of people, especially small business owners, uh, value you know the geographic uh, uh, closeness, proximity to their agent, the the local knowledge, things of this nature. How and, and this idea of trust, a, a person you can trust. And, and this was the idea that we were talking about. How does a brand, a technology brand such as Embroker, uh, engender trust? How do you build that trust that would normally have been something that that uh, somebody I might see at the at the you know local um, Lions yeah. Club you know, would have provided uh, to me before? Yeah. How do you build that trust with your customer? Well, I think you know it's a it's a really important question, and I, I think per the question that, that Caitlin asked, I mean, we absolutely recognize that a lot of people place um, you know a great deal of value on their relationship w with their broker, and I, I think it's something that we don't think about as unimportant at all. I think to the contrary, you know, I mean, worked in the industry and been on the board of a very large broker, I understand exactly how powerful those relationships are, and you know that they provide value. I, I think you know we're not saying that those will go away or need to go away at all, but I think what we are saying is we want to build something different, and the people that want to use something different, um, we want to prove that there's a market for that. I think increasingly, you know, that's one way of doing business, and it, you know, it's something that if there's a local agent that really is a pillar of the community and providing those services and has a really close relationship, that's probably you know not something that we'll compete very well with. And I think that that's that's okay. You know, it's like we're 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 not saying that that that, that, that doesn't exist anymore. But I think that being said, what what is certainly true is that if you look overall at how uh, people relate to brands and how trust works, that you know increasingly, um, you know younger people especially, they they trust brands more than they do people, which is for yeah. better or worse, it's just it's good for me. when you look at the surveys. Um, and you know that that is what we want to provide a market for, where we want to build trust by being really good at what we do, being highly competent, being highly efficient, and being very focused on the customer, so that when a customer reaches out to us, they know they're getting a great product, they know they're getting a great service. We won't be able to provide something, um, like perhaps we can't take them out to lunch and dinner all the time, but it, for people that value that, then you know we, that's not going to be a great customer for us, but that for people that want to do business in a way where I'm working with something that I know uh, is going to give me a great service and a great product, and that, that's the brand essence, then I think that that's the market for us. Mm -hmm. What about what about the competition? Uh, Brian asks, you know, what what have you learned from other online 
insurance uh, operations, and what are you doing differently? Uh, how are you differentiating yourself from that, both from a, a technological standpoint and from a brand standpoint? Uh, you know, yeah, the tech, think, technology and service in the brand. That's a good question. I think um, what uh, you know, I think what, what people have done. If you look at what's happened, um, and I think this is a common misunderstanding of our business, but if you look at uh, some of the developments in terms of you know, online agencies, which we don't consider ourselves one, by the way. We have, you know, a lot of different building software, but we're not necessarily an online agency. The, you know, basically they've taken what happened in personal lines. And so when you look at uh, personal lines, used to be all offline. And then because they're fairly simple and, and easy to, to uh, make more generic, brands like Geico and Progressive built, you know, a way to go online and buy personal insurance lines, like car insurance, and increasingly starting to be home insurance. Um, and so some of the early entrants into the commercial market, you know, are trying to basically do the same thing, which is like, let, let's take a paper application, let's put it up into, you know, HTML format, it's literally just the same questions, but now it's, you know, on, online, and, you know, collect the same information, send it, and that, that to us is, is not really uh, how, how we think about what we're trying to do, at least, which is rather than say, let's take what happened on personal lines and take it to commercial lines, we're trying to say, like, you know, how would a really big entity, how would a big organization like Boeing or McKesson buy insurance? Like, what tools would they have at their disposal? Like, how would they go through the process? And how can we build technology that, that will bring some of those same concepts but make them more approachable for middle market or smaller companies? Um, and so I think that we approach it from a very different angle, which is that, you know, I think that means that we'll be going after businesses that are, you know, probably larger in size than, than the online agencies are going after. Um, but we'll be providing more of a differentiated product that relates to, you know, something that a risk manager would use daily to, to perform his job. So when you, these, you know, a lot of the uh, questions are coming through that, you know, how do you market to these, to these people as opposed to going to the local chamber of commerce and, and things of this nature, how are your customers finding you and, and or how are you reaching out uh, to them? And, and, what, and what, what's the message that you're, that you're sending to them? Yeah, I mean, thus far we've been, you know, most of the demand that we've had has been kind of outbound. You know, our, our product is still in a closed beta, uh, and so, you know, we have uh, several hundred companies that are that are using it right now. But it's, you know, a small group and a small number. We haven't really started to uh, market more broadly because our technology has been still in development uh, for some time now. Um, but I'd say fundamentally, you know, we're very focused on one thing, which is just building a great product. Um, I think obviously we, we need to go sell it. We need to go acquire clients. But I think if, you know we think about our clients yeah. as, as how how can we build a really great product, and that it's a product that you know luckily it's a good business because you know every business in the U.S. has to buy this product, which is insurance it's more right. generally. Well, should, right? And so if we have a good mouse map and a good way to deliver that, we'll find a way to, to acquire clients. And I think there's a lot of different ways we can get into you know marketing and sales. But I think fundamentally we have a very core focus, which is you know building something that customers actually find value in. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, there was a question from Michael, your, your revenue model, I mean, I, what we, you know, I, I generally like to talk about brand and culture, but I suppose this idea of actually supporting the company, you can't have a brand and culture if you don't have a good revenue model. Um, how do you, you know, the, 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 the traditional way is, is relying on, on the commission from the, the carriers, paying a commission, you know, to the to the agents, how how are you uh, how how closely are you, are you hewing to this traditional revenue model, uh, and how or how are you changing it? Yeah, I'd say right now we're we're using the traditional revenue model where we get paid by commissions, pay commissions by carriers. I'd say you know in the future we're you know that like everything else are things that we're you know evaluating us. If it's something we can improve, we'll try to improve it. You know, I don't think we think anything sacred. Obviously, we need to pay the bills, and so <laughs> that is the way that we do it currently. But I think we'll we'll you know try to find uh, and continue to be innovative about what the best way is to finance our own operations and provide the services. Mm -hmm. And and a question came in from a from a guy named Don. Uh, he's a former insurance marker, and he is interested to know how are you working to avoid commoditization? And I I assume that a, a large part of that is going to be uh, how you position the brand and and. Uh, what what the brand stands for is that how, how how would you say that you're avoiding commoditization? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there's a number of ways to think about that. Um, one of them is just that you know we envision the role that technology can play in insurance and risk management is a pretty big one. I'd say we probably have a much larger and more expansive vision of that than I think anyone else in the industry. 
and we could be wrong. <laughs> you know, maybe people don't actually want to use technology and won't add that much value. But that being said, it's, it's something that we believe in. And so, you know, the way that we think about avoiding commoditization is investing in technology. You know, that eventually uh, technology should make things cheaper, it should make things more efficient. So, it, it, you know, it's less about that we need to protect privacy and it's more about we need to build the best and most, you know, user-friendly and most advanced technology that will help us, you know, do our core mission of making insurance work better. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about um, about your employment brand. The, you know, how do you telegraph your culture to the talent that you're looking to acquire? You know, especially given how how much competition there is for talent here in the Bay Area, or or are you locating uh, uh, offices and and development in in other places to try and and uh, have a, a different uh, approach to to uh, your your employment brand. How are you How are you meeting that challenge? Yeah, I think it's you know something that that's very you know obviously it's critical to our company like every company. Um, so I mean per, per the question on geography, yeah, we we have several offices. So we have an office here in San Francisco, we're in the city. We have an office in Chicago, uh, and then we have a small office in Boston as well. Uh, and so I think that helps give us some you know more expansive geographic footprint so that we, we have a little more flexibility in terms of finding the right people and, and putting them in the right place. Uh, but I think fundamentally it's, it's, you know, it's been interesting, I think, that we're, like, when we, uh, when we talk to prospective employees and we talk about what we do, I think one thing you'll notice, like, everyone here is very, very excited about insurance and insurance innovation, and that's probably a small group of people that fit that description that, that really show up every day and get excited. We're, we're very excited about what we're doing. And, it's not everyone that fits that, nor should it be. And so I think that, that that's been lucky for us, actually, that there's some self-selection in terms of people that actually want to, to work in insurance technology. And uh, it's been, uh, although I'd say like, there's an increasing you know, media emphasis on it, and we're starting to, I think, get more problem reps, fair weather fans that are along for the ride. But I think we're trying to find people that just really fundamentally believe in what we're doing and you know, want to be a part of it. And so far, we've had pretty good luck, I think. Well, this is, this is a question, you know, that... that I know that in the insurance industry, you know, my partner Peter Van Artrike is is very active in the insurance industry, and a, and a big part of the conversation is that this is an aging industry that that, that uh, it's really hard to attract young talent to the industry. And do you find that that your positioning as a as a technology brand helps uh, helps uh, attract that younger um, talent to to Embroker? Yes. <laughs> it's a short answer. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think we we have uh, um, a lot of we received a lot of really great um, you know inbound uh, um, applications and interests from from younger talent. But I, I would also stress that that you, you know we don't think that in any way being younger is better than being older. <laughs> like, I think it's the contrary. We need to be we involved, a lot. But, uh... Yeah, we have a lot to benefit and gain from people with a lot of experience in the industry. And so like our insurance team is actually you know really tenured and, and has a great deal of experience, and so I think that's something that, that we balance and have great import in. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, so there's a question. You're, you're in a, a closed beta at the moment. Are, are you finding validation with your customers? Is, is it, is it yeah, changing the way that they, are they telling, you know, what are they telling you in terms of how it's changing the way that, that uh, they view the insurance, uh, you know, the, the, the entire process of not only managing risk, but Suppose that there's that there's a loss. How how are you uh, working with them on on both sides of this, the risk management as well as the loss prevention? Yeah, I think you know it's interesting, and even the question is like, have you validated the business? You know, I think that it's it's a, it's a good question because um, we've received a lot of great feedback, and a lot of the feedback we've been has uh, we've gotten has been on you know things that would be great. Like, oh, I, you know, this is really good. Could you build this? Could you build that? Could you do this? And like the answer to all those questions is kind of yes. You know, we can build it. It's a question of time and resources. I think what you know, as anyone that's worked in the industry knows, you can imagine we face challenges just given our part in the ecosystem and working with carriers and kind of their uh, technological capabilities and you know also in a regulated space that make it really hard to move quickly, which we're fundamentally trying to do. You know, we're trying to move quickly. I think there is a limit to how quickly things can move because also you know, this is mission critical uh, work we're doing, you know, mistakes are not tolerated, or should they be. Uh, and so I think sometimes we need to balance our desire to move really fast with, uh, you know, both what are, what is possible to do and, you know, how quickly can we do it and what does it take to achieve that. So, you know, fundamentally, yeah, I mean, people like the product, they like using it much better than, than you know, kind of the status quo when they've received, but 
you know, I would stress that we're not even like one percent of the way done with the work that we want to do in terms of making it better. Like, this is something that will take years to to actually, you know, truly change. And I think that that's something that, again, going back to the point about game changes, like I don't think anything we've done yet is game changing, and I, I don't want to even have people perceive that that we feel that way. It's more of like it, it's the value. It's that this is what we're trying to do, and that we're going to keep working until we do it. And so, you know, yeah, I think that we've received a lot of validation and from people, and some of them have been, you know, we have businesses that were much, much larger, large companies that, that have reached out and you know, want to demo the technology. And so, I think that's been, it's been actually great, you know, to see see the level of interest thus far. Have you had any aha moments that you can share that just where you said, oh, we, <laughs> that never occurred to us, but it turns out to be like a, a key, or those uh, would you have to shoot uh, me and all the uh, attendees after you told us? No, I mean, I think there are some things that uh, oftentimes we, you know, I think just listening to customers, you always, you always learn things. Um, and, you know, some of them are just that we've been working on our end on, for so much and so close to the details that, you know, it's useful to take a step back and be like, well, you know, how does this even work or why don't you do this? And you, you learn a lot of things from companies that, that just, you know, listening to customers. And I think some of them are things that don't even require like a complicated technological solution. They're just, you know, like we want more transparency. Like tell us what markets you're going to. Tell us when I should expect to hear back. Kind of simple things that are actually very valuable. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, Nisha, do you want to let's let's see if there are any other questions, uh, you know, from the the uh, the audience out there. Um, so, folks, if you have any questions, go into your Q and A. Uh, your your chat function there and and uh, and send them to to Nisha and and she can send them through to us. Um, but you know I think that Matt you you mentioned you know that you're you're undergoing a um, you know you're doing some work on on updating the brand or refreshing it or or maybe just sort of right sizing it is maybe the right way to say it because it's still a very young brand. But um, how are you approaching that? That process, from a strategic point of view, are you? Um, do you have a, a, a strategy that you've written out and, and have gone through and and, and uh, really gotten all your key stakeholders and, and talked to some customers and said, okay, this is where our brand is missing the mark. Uh, this is where we need to, uh, you know, uh, need to to adjust it or change it. Um, how, how are you? How are you approaching that from again from a strategic point of view? Yeah, I think that we, you know, we've gone through and are you know in the very late processes of a, a rebranding exercise, and I think it's something that we're all you know super excited about. I think when we look at what our current brand worth had been, everyone here was attached to it, and so we, we first wanted to be like, all right, we, we don't want to change it, but I think once we actually thought about it from a strategic perspective. Like, you know, we're getting ready to um, really, you know, ramp growth and want to build something that uh, provides touch points that, that, you know, we can really build equity in and that, that, you know, we can stand behind for some time to come. You know, we felt we needed to have more investment in the brand and more thought to it. Um, and so I think where we come out is something that feels very fun, it feels different, uh, it feels um, very, very fresh and new and exciting. And I think that's, that's what uh, all things that we're, we're trying to embody. That's great, and and um, uh, and, and you know do you, when you're when you are working with with your team, how do you how do you sort of gauge how do you measure the clarity and alignment that your that your culture has behind the brand and, and the core values? You know, how do you how do you sort of gauge your your organizational health um, on an ongoing basis? Do you use any software, or, or do you do it informally? What's your process for, for culture building? Yeah, I mean, I think thus far it's been informal. We don't use any software tools. It's more of a, I think you can judge organizational health just by how excited people are to be in the office every day. Right? That's the most mm -hmm. obvious uh, telling point. I think are people, you know, with, even with, with the brand work, it's like, do people care about it? Like, are, are they excited to see the new brand? And do they not care? Uh, does it mean anything to them? Uh, and I think all those things you can just, I mean, we're not a huge organization. You know, we're still small, and so like, you can you can just um, perceive that from you know, right. how people react, and so that's kind of what we do. And what about when you when you uh, uh, eventually, probably a, a, a pretty um, near horizon eventuality? 
what, what, what about when you grow to the size where you don't actually know everybody personally? How, how do you think you're going to approach uh, brand and culture then? I think part of it is just instilling the culture and in, you know deeply in this initial group of the, when the company is young because if, if you have a great initial group and everyone does believe in it and when they hire people that you know they'll tend to hire people that, that also believe and that are the right fit and so I think the more emphasis you can place on it while you're younger the easier it is to, to hold on to it as you grow. Yeah, so we have a, a couple of questions here. Uh, thanks, Nisha, for these. Um, so Jim, Jim wants to know uh, about. Uh, it's sort of uh, he, he brings up Zenefits and how their desire to move fast, and you discuss this a little bit. Their desire for for speed kind of overran the um, overran the regulatory uh, constraints, and and uh, you, you again you, you did discuss this a little bit, but but you know just sort of in general, how do you how do you balance that you know? Uh, you know how, how do you how do you deal with regulatory hurdles when you feel like your your technological solution is maybe there, or how do you develop a technological solution uh, and and then sort of put it on the shelf, knowing that it could be a year and a half or two years before the insurance commissioner of a particular state gets around to approving it, or don't you don't you have those challenges? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I did address this, which is that they are, you know, we think about it as, as a framework and a guideline that gives you, you know, very clear instructions on what you need to do. <laughs> so it's, it's not, I, I think, a hurdle in that way. It's, it's, there's, there's a list of things you need to do, though, and part of it is just the, the culture that you create and the tone from the top of saying, like, these are, like, there's no ambiguity about whether we need to do them. We do, in fact, need to do them. <laughs> it is 100% certain that we need to do them. And you know, I think mean, part of that also is we brought on someone with a very senior level to help manage that process for us. Mm -hmm. um, Paul wants to know: Are you are you looking to a future where where you evolve past traditional carriers? Um, do you think that there's an alternative risk scenario that a broker could help bring about? I, I think that you know if you look 20 years into the future whomever is at the forefront of efficiently pricing risk will be those that will be on the other counterparty of the trade. And you know, mm -hmm. insurers right now have a great deal of experience and, and expertise, and I think you know, they do have some need to reinvent their own business, but uh, you know, I expect they'll be able to do that, or if not all of them, at least some of them. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question from Brian. You know, what are you most proud of, uh, Ed and Broker, your accomplishments? Yes. I'd say really it's the, the team that, that we put together, and, you know, it's, uh, and we're very cognizant of the, the work that we're doing is just starting, you know, we're, we're just getting started, but I feel extraordinarily proud of all my colleagues and the fact that they've chosen to, to join me in this room. They're a really great group of people, and I feel honored that they've chosen to work there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a, a question, and uh, I, I uh, uh, being a West Coast operation at, at, at its core, you know, there are certain uh, norms, societal norms that we have out here in California um, and in terms of, of, you know, bringing your dogs to work and, and how you dress, uh, you know. I don't think I've, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the tech world, I haven't seen a tucked in shirt in, you know, in, in years now. And, and, and working within this, this, uh, this rather conservative insurance field, how do you how do you approach that in terms of you know do do the and again this is a question of trust uh, do people look at at you and at others in your organization and say wait a minute these people couldn't possibly be insurance professionals uh, there's there's no suit and tie there mm, yeah I don't know maybe at first <laughs> I don't know but I think that uh, the certainly you know this is how we, being able to dress how we want and look how we want has part of our values, right? And it has nothing to do with how confident you are at your job. And I think our organization and our experience speak for itself. And you know, when you look at the fact that for an agency of our size, we'll probably have more direct appointments with carriers than any, anyone else in the country. It's like, well, I think people believe. <laughs> so I don't need to put on a suit and tie. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you. I, having been chastised in Columbus, Ohio for, uh, somebody said to me, you know, if if you want you and your ideas to be taken uh, seriously, you won't show up in those blue jeans tomorrow. And I just thought to myself, "What?" <laughs> but you know, these things uh, these things uh, come up, especially in these 
in these more state industries. I, I, you know, it, it, and it's always surprising to me uh, when I run into that kind of scenario. But uh, uh, tell us a little bit about about the the horizon. What what are the the, the biggest opportunities? What are the, the biggest threats that you see there? Um, not just for a broker, but for the insurance industry uh, in in general, and and the the broker channel perhaps. Yeah, I think I mean the the biggest opportunities I think are are those things that really help us move forward as a society. I mean, I think we're facing serious risks that are different risks than we faced ten years ago. I mean, uh, like our cyber exposure, I don't really even have any idea what it is. And it could be you know something that's so massive that it would bring down our entire economy and government interaction. We don't know that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's that's an example of an area where the industry has a great part to play in terms of how do we you know, provide products that address new risks in a way that is palatable and accessible for businesses and consumers. And I think the other opportunity is engaging uh, a younger generation of people uh, into the business and into the product. That's something that, that are valuable and something that um, there's a reason to buy you know, that aren't, aren't just about caveman commercials and things like that, but that, that actually there's real core value in these products. Um, and so I think that, you know, those, those are great opportunities. Um, I think in terms of, of, of risks uh, that, that we face, I mean, one of them I think is that if the, the industry overall does not do a good job of, at reinventing itself and you know making itself retain relevancy, then uh, it will risk losing an entire generation of buyers. You know, young people today don't engage with insurance, and uh, you know they're that they're soon going to be the majority of our population. <laughs> so yeah. if, if we can't yeah, create that, things, that, that's and, actually yeah, that, that's a good segue into a question here from uh, Kevin. And he says, can better data and access to data drive new insurance product development? Uh, his example is, you know, bundling traditional insurance products with behavior change incentives. It can, can technology, is this, is this something that you're looking at, this, uh, this idea of, 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 of uh, fostering uh, behavior change to, to uh, you know, using technology to, to lower the risk profile? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I think is really exciting, uh, and, and it can range from you know any number of different things. I mean, at, at a very simple level, when you think about you know restaurants that, that buy coverage for food spoilage, you know if you have a refrigerator that's uh, connected to the internet that can tell you if it's open and you close it, <laughs> then you know that cost of that coverage to go down. And uh, you know I think that that's you know, starting from examples like that and going all the way through any different line of coverage. I think you know having technology that's more integrated with other systems is is a you know, huge, huge opportunity to you know, invent new products and, and change the way that, that risk pricing works. Very good. Um, well, this this has been you know I, I think uh, we probably had a lot of insurance people in the in the audience and I, but I think that even for those who were uh, are not in in the insurance industry, I, I I think this has been a tremendously interesting conversation. I think that the idea of being a challenger brand in in, in a really uh, traditional industry is um, is really uh, it's a really great discussion and I appreciate very much uh, you taking the time uh, to speak with us today. Yeah, great. I appreciate the time as well and thanks to everyone for joining. Very good. Yeah, everybody, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Nisha is going to come back on here and and uh, tell you a little bit about you know when you can access this recording uh, the recording of this session if you'd like. But in the meantime, um, uh, again, thank you, Matt Miller from Embroker. Uh, he is at M Atlas Miller on Twitter. Is that did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. M Atlas Twitter, and uh, I'm at Twesling on Twitter. <laughs> That's T Wesling, T W E S S L I N G, and you can learn more about Chromium by going to ChromiumBranding.com. And so we thank you very much for being a part of this. And uh, Nisha, I will turn it over to you and look forward to speaking to all of you again uh, at our next coffee chat.